Yeah, good morning. We are from last week's presentation. We basically discussed what a theory is and what it does, and it's really advanced to, to managing the media structure. Now, as I said last week, today we'll go full time to uh, a number of these theories. We'll discuss them, what they tend to achieve, and of course, uh, what are their shortfalls. Because as I said, every theory has its strength and the shortfall. Would you mind maybe shifting to somewhere there so that we can make good use of the recording uh, device?
So he's one of those theorists who came up with one um, uh, classical management theory. His other colleague is Henry Fayo. Henry Fayo, 1841 to 1925. All right? So the only difference between the two is that Frederick Taylor. Yes, yes. So Frederick Taylor came up with a classical scientific management theory. A classical scientific management theory. While on the other hand, his colleague, Henry Pyle, came up with a classical administrative management theory. So here the catchword is one is scientific, the other one is administrative. But they are both classical management theory. And that's the approach which they adopted. So maybe let's start with the first one, Frederick uh, Taylor, who came up with um, uh, his scientific management theory. Let's see what his theory talks about. This is one of the most highly used uh, management theory. It's very popular, very old, but still useful to date. These are some of the theories that the so-called experts will use. A theory, as we say, will guide you to by appreciating the past, determining the present, and predicting the future. So when you hear of when you hear of the so-called experts on TV, in radios, to make comments on issues. Basically, they will use theories. Theories in different fields. You could have theories in politics. So the so-called political commentators who would make comment on any political currents. Basically, what they do is to use a particular theory to analyze what has happened presently and predict the future because these things are already said. So when you talk of Frederick Taylor's scientific management theory, historically we are told that Mr. Frederick Winslow Taylor, he was a German, and this guy made many contributions to the scientific management. And eventually, he became commonly referred to as the father of scientific management, a guru. So when you talk of scientific management, he is one of the greatest, right? But what does scientific management aim at? What are the aims of scientific management theory? So basically, when we talk about scientific management theory, the aim is, as I said earlier, to increase productivity. So 
So it's to increase productivity. The question is how? To increase productivity by increasing efficiency and wages of works. And wages of work. You said the aim. The aim is to increase productivity by, by increasing efficiency and wages of work. So, according to him, his theory, right? Its primary purpose, if you are to make use of it, is to increase productivity. How do you achieve that productivity? Is by increasing the efficiency and wages of works. How is that achieved? According to him, the theory seeks to find out the best methods of doing each job. Right? Imagine a situation maybe this was a, a tailoring company, for example. Right? So you have different tailors. You have designers. Now when you are tailoring, you are supposed to be an expert in a particular part, if it's an arm, for example, right? So you concentrate on your arm. Somebody will make maybe the collar. Another person will make maybe the, the pocket, you know? So, according to this guy, Frederick Taylor, The aim of this his theory is to find out the best method of doing each job. How you use scientific methods or scientific procedures in one selecting employees and you give those employees scientific training and development. So it's not just a matter of Picking each and every tailor. Okay? You also use a scientific method to get these employees, or in this case, these tailors. In other words, the scientific management believes in establishing, maintaining, and of course sustaining what is called a close cooperation and mutual understanding between management and employees. So there is this gap. There's a clear demarcation between management and on the other side, we have employees. However, this scientific management approach believes in establishing, maintaining and sustaining that close cooperation, where management and employees would have a close cooperation and mutual understanding between them. It also uses what is called division of labor. How every time when it tries to produce maximum output, how does it achieve that? By fixing performance standard for each job. How is this achieved? Uh, no, the division of labor is achieved by fixing the performance standards. But I'm asking how do you achieve the fixation of performance standards? How do you know that employee A, for example, 
performs better than employee B. Or employee C is more efficient than employee D. How do you assess that? Well, you are saying based on their skills, let's see how uh, Mr. Frederick Taylor scientifically did that. The other thing other than performance standard is also to have what is called differential piece rate system of payment. We will later understand and appreciate the meaning of piece rate system. But from the term, you can deduce what that means, where basically it means you are paid according to how much you have produced. It's not just a matter of I've been in this class and I'm supposed to wait for two hours of teaching, but for the first 20 minutes or 30, I didn't have students. Would I consider myself to have wait? No, because I've not produced anything. Okay, so we'll go further to see how this red system for payment works. However, let's move on to see. Let's move on to see the specific contribution of Taylor's suggestion. His theory, what did he say, and what are the specific areas that the theory contributed? Okay? So, as I say, the very first contribution of Taylor's theory is the establishment of performance standard. So, it is said that in his study, Taylor's study, when he was coming up with this particular theory, okay, he discovered that there were no scientific standards for measuring work performance. You remember I said, you need to establish that, how do you determine that employee A is more productive than employee B? Is it a matter of staying on the job longer than they are? What are the issues which you need to consider? You're talking of issues of quality, for example. Do you consider that to measure somebody's uh, performance or somebody's um, uh, efficiency? So, this particular guy discovered that there were no scientific standards. People would simply say, well, everybody came to work and the assumption is their performance was equal. So they have to be paid equal. Welcome. Go ahead once again. I got lost. I've been looking around. I didn't know the test was over here. Ah. Yeah, so I went back and I don't know the title. Right. right. Oh, it's always our class. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure you eight, so. Eight was taken by Dr. Dr. Square, okay. yeah, yeah, okay. but it's fine, we are not too late. Yeah. We are now going straight into the uh, specific theories. Okay. I gave you a reading assignment. Mm -hmm. Which of the theories did you read? Um, I read about three because I find it very Mm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Which theory did you theories um, did you? They are not uh, the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, but I, I was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So before you came, we talked about. 
uh, classical management theories. So we say it within the classical management because there are many theories within the classical management. So we say you would uh, concentrate on two. And these two were devised by these two gentlemen. One Frederick Taylor and the other one Henry Pyle. So what we are saying is the difference between the two, though they all follow within classical management, one is Frederick Taylor's is called scientific classical management. Mm -hmm. And the other one is called administrative classical management. So he found us discussing what Frederick Taylor's scientific management says. What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? So as we were coming in, we were discussing the contributions that the Frederick Taylor's scientific classical management has done towards uh, uh, management theories. So as we were coming in, as we were getting seated, we said the very first uh, contribution or suggestion that uh, Taylor's scientific management theory came up with was the establishment of performance standards. Why? Because in his study, he discovered that there was no scientific standard of measuring weights performance. That's why I was saying, how do you establish that weather A is more efficient than weather B. Do you establish because somebody has been in the office longer than they are? Would you take that as a determinant to say weather A is more efficient because he has stayed longer? So we are going to see how scientifically he came up with the performance standard to show that indeed employee A is more efficient because of the following. So basically, that's what we are discussing. And continuing from there, we are saying, he also discovered that no one could tell how much weight should be done in a given period, say an hour. Right, you will all go into your respective office. Say, after an hour, how much weight would you have done within that particular hour? Okay, it could be a day, it could be a week. So, usually, the way we do it, the week is usually fixed. Okay. So what did Taylor do when he discovered that the way things are done is simply the use of the rule of thumb or rate of thumb or where you simply say the amount of weight done by an average worker. So you determine one's performance from an average performer. But this particular guy, what he did was to introduce what is called time and motion. We'll discuss what time and motion studies means. But basically, this was to fix the standard, um, performance standard for time, cost and quality of weight. So you see that these three are very important. If I'm an employer, all right? If you guys are working, one of the most important things, determinant for me to pay you is your time, isn't it? If you don't come, whether you have weight in how you come, but the fact that you it's unlikely that I'm going to pay you. Right? So that could be the very first determinant. And the second is the cost. Your contribution. 
should be attached to how much I should pay you. Alright? Then, third year is the quality of work. Yes, you could avail yourself. But you look at the quality of work you are delivered. That will also determine how much I should give you. Okay? So these three will they give uniformity to work. So what this guy did in order to establish the common standard was to come to, to, to bring these two uh, three issues, the cost, time, and efficiency, so that you could all want to easily measure one's efficiency. Cost? Yes, we are here, yeah, the scientific manager, Mr. Taylor. Right? Mostly, he deals with you as an individual. There's nothing collective. There's no teamwork. It's you as an individual and what you are going and what you are capable of contributing. That's what this guy is. You will appreciate later once we start talking about this guy. This guy is more administrative. Where issues of teamwork are concerned, are discussed. But since we are not here yet, let's move on with Frederick and see how or what he contributed or his suggestion in his scientific management theory. The second thing. Let me write this up. Is establishment of performance standards. The second one is development of differential piece rate system. So what do we mean by development of differential piece rate system? What prompted Taylor to come up with that contribution or that suggestion? It is said that Taylor observed that some workers do as little work as possible, yet those who do the lion's share of the job gain nothing extra. Now you see that Taylor's theory still concentrates on individual performance and like group performance. That's why his observation was to see that you could have a team, but within the team, some people's contribution is so minimal. Others, they work so hard and contribute immensely. Right? But even if you work so hard and contribute more to the group or to the work, you get nothing. That's one of these observations. Right? Imagine yourself if you are a manager. You have a team to look after. Some are working so hard, others are not. But by the end of the day, each one of them will get their salaries, regardless of their performance. Is that fair? That was his observation. Right? So what did Taylor do? That's where now Taylor had to devise a system to ensure that those who contribute more should also what? Okay. 
So he applied what is called differential piece rate system. Under this system, a low wage rate was fixed for workers of low performance output. So those who did not contribute more, there was a low rate wage. Right? Why did Taylor do that? Taylor did that because he believed that through that particular method, right, the inefficient workers will try to improve their efficiency. Isn't it? Because nobody would want to be any can run a project. So they will also want to improve their efficiency so that they also gave more. The other reason was this was also improved, or rather the efficient one, those who work so hard, okay, will be motivated to maintain or even do better. Because there's this component of wage. Always remember that Taylor is dealing with individuals. It's up to you as an individual. If you perform well, you gain well. There's no teamwork here. Okay? There's nothing like you would cover him because he has got problems, because he's sick. No, he has not performed. Okay? The third thing is that another contribution of Terra is that he called for change in mental attitude and mental resolution. Revolution. According to him, he said the mental revolution, what he meant was management and workers, right? So you need to always consider you yourself as management, isn't it? And you have your workers. So by mental revolution it means management and workers should have a positive attitude towards each other. Very important, isn't it? Remember, going back to the definition of management, okay, is making use right of resources these people financial or physical assets to achieve their goal right by planning organizing and the rest of those things okay but for you to be seen to be a good man to achieve you make use of these people isn't it? So that's why he is advocating for mental revolution, where you need now to ensure that management and your workers have the positive attitude towards each other. Because if you don't have the positive attitude, you may not achieve it. And that is applicable in every mental situation, isn't it? In school, if students have negative attitude towards their lectures, for example, chances are you are going to struggle in that way, isn't it? Likewise, if a lecturer has negative attitude towards your student, say, ah, oh, student A, no, 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 
that's that lady, oh, that young man, oh, it's a problem. The definitely it should be a problem. So you should adjust your mind in such that you remove all those negative issues and bring the positivity so that together you can achieve the results that are required. So increased productivity would only come about if there is that mental revolution. What are the other issues in Mr. Frederick's uh, uh, studies? He advocated for time study. What he, he meant, you remember earlier when we talked about the uh, costs, uh, what's the other one? Time and bedding efficiency. Here, they are bringing in another issue of time, where by advocating for time study, what he meant was the time taken for doing each part of the job. Time taken for doing each part of the job. So what he did in coming up with that, he first observed the full job and he did analyze the full job and after analyzing the full job, he then divided it into different parts, okay, and then later the time taken for doing each part of the job was recorded. I was giving an example of a, a textile company where they, they, they make your tops, right? Definitely, there's somebody who does just the arm, somebody who does just the collar, somebody who do the back, somebody who do the, the pockets, somebody who fix the patterns, isn't it? So this guy had to measure time taken to do each part of those and not the whole. Okay? So that by the end you establish how long it would take to make just this arm, two minutes, the four, two minutes. You should be able now to establish how much time is required to make the entire uh, jacket. Right? So, the full job, what he did was to observe and analyze the full job. He then divided it into two different parts. Later, the time taken for doing each part of the job was recorded. So, you record time taken for doing each part of the job. This was done using literally by a stopwatch. So you are starting doing your arm, you set your stopwatch to zero, and you stop it once you finish that. To Mr. Taylor, time study helps management to know exactly the amount of time it will take to do a particular job, and that is very important. Okay? It is important for efficiency. You remember, scientific management is nothing but to increase efficiency. I went to NRB, National Registration Bureau, yesterday to get an ID for my daughter. She, we, we made an application in 2021. As of yesterday, it was too much. We do call that efficient. Now, what Terra did was to establish how long does it take, right from the processes of capturing, filling the form, taking the data, capturing the picture, 
doing the production and issuing it out. How long does that take? If you go there, you find that that process will take maybe 15 minutes or, or less. But here I am, since 2021, I'm yet to get the ID for my daughter. Is it efficient? So this is exactly why Mr. Frederick Taylor came up with a time style. So you can too apply at every institution. Say, oh, no, wait a minute. How long does this take for you to do this? You find that there are times when you have a project and you want somebody to work for you. A job that might take, say, one week, somebody will do it in three weeks. Why? They have got other interests. Maybe every day you are giving them transport money. So they are not losing anything. On top of that, you are giving them lunch. And they have the capacity and the capability to save part of that lunch money. So if you are not careful, if you are not applying this, if you are not sure that that particular week should take one week and not two weeks, you are going to lose out. So issues of efficiency will be out of hand. Okay? So according to Mr. Taylor, time study helps you or helps management to, a, to know exactly the amount of time it will take to do a particular job. So this will enable you to shape the amount of work to be done by each worker in a given time, say one hour, one day, two weeks, and so on and so forth. The fifth, final and fifth observation, suggestion, according to this scientific management, yeah, Mr. Taylor, was Mr. Taylor called for functional formanship or division of labor. Function formanship or division of labor. Function formation or division of labor, as the term suggests, this simply means advocating specific duties for specific person. Okay? So you advocate a specific duty for a specific person. According to their expertise, of course. This is so because Taylor observed that a foreman cannot be an expert in all functions. If you go to construction sites, there's always a foreman. You have heard about that, right? But on a construction site, there are quite a number of Things taking place. For example, if it's a building like this one, other than replay, okay, you need, for example, a plumber, you need an electrician, right? You need uh, uh, a carpenter, okay? Somebody who will fix the roof. These are all different expertise, but you have got one format whose field could only be maybe that of replay, right? So do you expect that person to be efficient when it comes to fixing electrical things? So according to Taylor, he called for a functional formation, whereby you are a specifically, right, an expert in the field you are doing. That's why,
he separated planning from doing. You can plan, yes. But when it comes to doing the actual work, right? You need to give specific duty to specific people. That's what he meant by advocating uh, uh, functional foremanship or division of labor. All right? Having said all these things, these are what he suggested, what he proposed, what he discovered in his study to come up with this particular theory. Right? Every theory, as I said when I was introducing this subject, I said each and every theory has got its criticisms, its challenges, its gray areas, where I said, hmm, although you are doing this, but you are missing this particular important area. That's typical of each and every theory. And when you are applying your theories in future, your other job is to, to critique such theories. Right? You should be able to say, no, 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 no. I will not use this particular theory in this situation because it has got the following weaknesses. As a topic of your research, you can simply critique a theory and say, no, proof, this theory does all these things, but it lacks on this particular area, according to, and it has to be empirical. I mean, it has to be scientific, isn't it? So the question is, what are the criticisms, right? Because some people have already criticized this theory. This does not lend it useless. No, it's still useful and it is used all over the world, but it has got its shortfalls. So what are these shortfalls when it comes to Frederick's uh, 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 scientific management theory? Okay? Are you confused? You're not? Am I making sense? Or am I talking to myself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, much as the theory sounds good, he established all these things, but his theory still came under a series of criticism. So I want us now to go th through at least four criticisms that people who don't like this theory will attack it on. Okay? What are these? And always when you are dealing with any other theory, always look at its weaknesses and critique it because there is no perfect theory. Right? As we move on and look at these other theories. They are actually criticizing one another. Say, so, no, theory of two will only concentrate on this. What about this answer? That's how, what a theory does. So the very first criticism about uh, Frederick Files, uh, uh, rather Terra's scientific management theory, is that he treats Humans like machines. Is that true? Yeah. It is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You can see how he has put much emphasis, so much so that efficiency from individuals should be treated somehow like machines. He failed to appreciate the fact that you are using humans and there are some attributes in humans that may not apply as if he is or she is a machine. Okay? His emphasis is on efficiency, regardless. So in here, there are no issues of we are in a we are in a bit of drama, we are in a bit of many no, 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 because 
the critics about this film, it says he has treated humans like machines. That is the first criticism. So if you are a manager and you want your employees to be as efficient and you want to treat them as machines, then you use Frederick Taylor's scientific uh, management theory. Okay. Where you establish performance standards, right? You will develop piecework systems, okay? You will change or introduce a mental revolution, all right? People should be paid according to time spent on time they they make they produce function formation. If you are not a, 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 a doctor, then you can't treat anybody. Right? That's according to Frederick Taylor. But somehow, besides that, he treats people like machines. What's the second criticism? His principle tends to portray money as the only motivating factor for workers performance. Is that true? You know, he has always attached establishment of performance standards. There's money attached. You remember when we said that he introduced a low rate wage cut, isn't it? So that people should be motivated and say, no, let me be as efficient so that I gain more money. So according to him, Rather, according to his critics, they say that his theory draws much on money as if money is the only motivating factor of workers. But is that true? Do people always want to money? Yeah. Right now, in this generation. In this generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this theory will be more practical, yes. isn't it? Yes. Very much. You see? So you can always use this theory. Because as you are putting it, money is everything. Okay. According to this generation. But he chooses to do. Sometimes we say peace of mind. Mm -hmm. Ever heard of that? There's no peace of mind. If there's no money. Right now. Everybody in the money is still responsible now. Yes, yes, please. I think, you know, sometimes, like, since there's an element of division of labor, right? Mm -hmm. They say, I'm, 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 I'm curious that doing something, mm -hmm. right? You're passionate about it. Mm -hmm. I doing something that you can say, that I'm doing this before. But then you're doing it so that maybe you want to, you want to gain more knowledge, mm -hmm. expand your skills, form them, something like that. Yeah, so, so, no, I, I know we, we are going to look into the other fields. And that's 10% of now. He uh, <laughs> doesn't actually, you have to go through that. I tell you, you have to go through that right now. People are using the word to change you, everybody. <laughs> Even now, if you speak to a young and you ask them why they're doing that, they actually tell you, ah, ah, if you want me to do something, you do that. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, wait maybe until we go through the other theories okay. and see if indeed uh, your situation, a predictor, fits so well in your situation. Because you find that the other theories will even be more befitting to the Malawi scenario now than Frederick Taylor. Because, you know, Frederick Taylor, remember issues of efficiency. Yes, everybody wants money, but issues of efficiency. Issues of quality in Malawi. Are we good? Much as everybody wants money, and we are ready to do anything for money, but you see that there are some some 
people that are not fit for the job. For example. For example. For example. Yet this guy says of functional uh, format. Ah, that doesn't make that business good here. Yeah. You see? Yeah. In, in, in most jobs, in the government. You see, some, yes, somebody yeah. in government or all the people have maybe employed one another on the basis of maybe my cousin, my, yeah. my brother. They are not even qualified yeah. and they are, they are meant to do the job. Yeah. But Taylor was against that. Mm. Only experts, who people who know what exactly they are doing. So you can plan, but doing is something else. Doing should be left to people who know that job. So, yes, some would be applicable in the context where everybody needs money. But you find that some of the establishments may not be applicable. So you wait until we go through the other uh, uh, theories. Let's move on to the paid criticism. The first one we say, he is said to treat people like machines, right? Then the second one, he has portrayed money as the only motivating factor for workers' performance. What's the third criticism? Labor unions have also criticized the principle for their tendency to restrict them from collecting but gaining. You know what labor unions are? Right? These are trade unions. Okay? Who would but gain? on behalf of the entire workforce. But this particular guy doesn't look at workers as a group. He looks at workers as individuals. Okay? That's where the trade unionists are coming in and say, look, we work for a group. But this theory uh, doesn't identify a group identify individuals. You see the conflict. So, labor unions have criticized the principle for their tendency to restrict them for collective. So, this would restrict them because if they come as a group, for example, if people are to go on strike, right? They will go on strike because of an issue that might affect Maybe many people, isn't it? But usually, in this environment, nothing will affect a group. Everything will affect the individual. Because you as an individual, if you don't perform, then either you are going to get less, low wages, or it could even be fired. On that basis. But if you are not using this particular field, then people will be rated as a group. So we have no basis to fire you because the group has performed, although you as an individual did not perform. So if you are fired, you, are, you should be able to say, but we deliver. The we deliver, not I deliver. You see the difference? According to him, you should be able to say, I deliver, and not we deliver. So, trade union would come for the we. Well, this guy says no, it's the you as in the we. Are you, are you following that? Do you know what trade union do? Okay? Civil service trade union. Yes. Ownership, if somebody has uh, been um, an injured, they will represent you, blah, blah, blah. blah. But this one, yes, it's not about them, it's you. If you want to fire somebody on the basis of underperformance, it will be difficult. Because if you don't use this, the performance is bundled together. Team we made a Yabak achieve. Then we put it, Kumana was on a way. So what? As in the group deliver, it has. And that's exactly what happened in that one. Okay? It's group. Whether they go to work or not, nobody cares. So that's the criticism about that. 
And the final criticism, I say it, this is not limited because you can also come up with your own criticism. But the final one is that we are saying that these principles were also criticized for excluding employees from participating in management. You remember, I was giving an example where I said there's need for closer collaboration and maintainment. What that means is there's a big and clear gap between management and employees, right? So this is exactly what the critiques of this particular theory are saying, that they he exclude employees from participating in management. Because if you look at this, it's simply communication coming from top to bottom. We expect this because we are going to give you money. So everything here is coming from money. Any question? Hmm? We are done with this project here. Yes. Like how I said to us in excluding the employees from the economy and uh activity. Okay. An interesting question. What do you think? You know, it, it's, it's possible that if you go, if you read through the theory details, right, you would identify those traits where, even if you look at the establishments, coming with or establishing a performance standard, who would do this? Hmm? Management. Because all they look at is efficiency in employees. The management look at you as a machine to produce. So already on this one, you see that there's a gap between managers because their interest is not about you. Their interest is efficiency, productivity. Let's look at this, development of different pistols. If you are an employee, will you develop your own pistol? So what this means is, no employee was involved in this, is never involved in this. It's purely the elite in the management team, right? That will sit and say, how can we extract the best out of these people? It's nothing like, how do we extract the best out of ourselves? So you see how employees are put out of management, out of decision making. If you look at all these things, change mental attitude or revolution, already this will tell you that they are not one and the same. That's why they want to develop that positive attitude between management and employees. Look at time study. All these things. Maybe what example? This is more of, if I may put it, authoritative, where communication is coming from up to bottom. Do you think this would mean management involving employees to come up with this? Is it possible? Any other question before we move to Mr. Henry Pyle? This administrative now. The first was then we are going to administrative. Let's pay attention to establish what's the difference between these two. Remember, all these are classical management theories, right? 
and there are many other problems. We have only concentrated on this two because these are the facts, the rules of management theories. But there are many, many, many uh, management theories. Okay? So maybe to answer your question about Mr. Frederick Terras, uh, a criticism where they say that he was criticized for uh, excluding employees from participating in management. Perhaps until we start going through this, that's when we can now appreciate. Because Henry Files administrative management here, all right? That particular school of thought, okay? It sees management, okay, as a process, okay? I'll put my okay? It's how you gain efficiency from your employees by using scientific methods. Why would this particular guy, Mr. Henry Fire, who came up with administrative management theory, he sees management as a process, right? A process of getting things done through people as a group, instead of this guy who saw people as individuals. You, you see now how the two differ. That's why one is administrative. This one is scientific. You want to put science on individuals to be efficient. By creating all these funny, funny, funny rules and regulations. Why don't we start fire? His administrative management approach, right? is where he see management as a process of getting things done through people as a group instead of as individuals. So just as background, history of this guy, Mr. Henry File, Henri, Henri, because he was a friend in that industrialist, and he was also a management for Zata. Yes. Yeah. And we are going to look at Americans, Japanese, and the, actually, you are right, there is always a reflection of who they are. As yeah. Yeah. You see, you will not be surprised to see this country from, 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 from the channel because it's, it's infatuated, right? Though these are universal and applicable in every situation. But you can see some influence of their background. And this is very common. You remember when we are teaching uh, critical writing and the review? These are the things which we learn. Okay? Every book, every piece of work, every artistic work reflects the author or the creator. Okay? So this guy, he wrote a book entitled Industrial and Game of Administration, published in 1916. Okay? Industrial and Game of Administration. You can take note of that. You can look for it. You can manage to get it data for you. But Industrial and Game of Administration, 1916. But that book has been simplified because mostly in that book he gave about 14 principles of mind. And that's what he's popular with. 14 principles of management. Always remember the main difference between these two is how they use people. 
right? One, administratively, they use people as a group to achieve whatever they want. So whatever is contained in the memory file is how it's a group dynamic, right? While this one is how we use an individual to be effective, to be productive. How can I make my brand very productive? So you put all these things to you. It doesn't look at production from a grouping. Why would this guy? It's about teamwork. It's about group dynamics. Right? So in that particular book, he came up with what are popularly known as 14 principles of management. You find that as we go along this 14, some would be similar to what Mr. Frederick Taylor said already. Because mind you, management is basically the same. You remember the functions of management? You have to undergo all those functions, regardless of which one you are using. So you find that some of the things are similar, or maybe they're slightly different, but mostly, there are only main major issues that we differentiate between these uh, 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 these theories. All right. For example, one of the principles of management, according to Henri Five, is division of work. You remember about the function of formation, division of labor. Yeah. Something similar. Okay, what does this say about the division of work as the very first principle in his 14 principles of mind? According to him, he says duties should be divided into sections. Right? So, you need to have a section, you need to have a division, you need to have a department with specialists handling each section. So, according to him, Mr. Conry, such specialization, okay, will allow individuals to build up expertise, okay, and therefore become more of that. So this guy, he has more patience. He will give you a chance to choose a field of expertise. So that with time, you become an expert. Once you become an expert, you become productive. Even at a larger scale, an institution like this one, has got a goal, isn't it? What does the, what's, what's our model? Think ahead, stay ahead, isn't it? Think ahead, stay ahead. How, how, how do we achieve that? Yeah, there should be division of to achieve that, right? So, in the IT sector, for example, okay, so you could have a section ICT. Whatever they do, they want to achieve, they want to contribute towards achieving that main goal that the investor wants to achieve. You have heard about sustainable development goals, okay? to achieve health uh, people in, by 2030. Okay? How do I achieve that? So each and every section in the health section, they have got something to contribute if they want to achieve that. Right? In government, the presidency has got goals they want to achieve. Mr. President has five. Right? Maybe let's give an example of the war against 
corruption. Okay? So people have always argued that if we are to achieve to eliminate corruption, right? It's not one man's job. It's not Chizuma's job at all. Is it? Perhaps this is a typical example of Mr. Fire's division of work, where Chizuma can do a part, right? But Chizuma alone will simply take somebody, maybe he can arrest, investigate, but then before that, he needs to get consent from the DBB. If DBB says no, would government achieve its war on corruption? No. But even if DBB says yes, Chizuma will make the arrest and take the issue to court. If the court says no, are we going to achieve the goal? So you see that division of work would ensure that each specialized section handle each specialized duties. Right? But the only difference with my example is that this kind of specialization, okay, will allow individuals to build expertise. Because I will not be a judge of concepts. If I'm into investigation, I will concentrate on doing investigation. That's my view. If somebody is there to prosecute, for example, I'll be a prosecutor. That's my view. Okay? So there is that kind of division where you put different sections, people get experts in that particular section, in particular division, in particular department, so that together, that's exactly how it is done in Malawi or elsewhere. For a ministry, it has got a goal. But that goal is achieved by different departments. So contribution by each and every department together will come up with contribution. Now in departments, we'll have expertise. Who are very good at what they do. Okay? Ministry of Tourism, Catch and Wildlife. We have experts in wildlife, we have experts in tourism, we have experts in culture. So together, they bring the ministry to achieve. I don't know if my example is giving sense, where we say Mr. Henry Pyle advocated as one of his principles of management is that of the nature of work. So in a section, in your media house, you would have to have a number of sections. You put in each every section to be handled by specialists who, with time, will acquire specialization. Once they acquire specialization, they become more efficient and more productive. That's the bottom line. Now you see that Mr. Pyle, his approach to come up with efficiency has nothing to do with this. Okay? This guy kind of respects people. You know much again. You are a graphic designer. So your job is to design. With time, you get the expertise and the experience and you become efficient and more productive without necessarily bringing in this things. You see the difference? There are about 14 principles of money. The second one, who can guess? Discipline. Discipline is a one piece of money according to any file. Mm -hmm. 
Ah, because you see, I can throw an empty bottle of water from my, my car's window. I can throw, I can litter and have. Just because it's you in a car. If this is done by somebody else, it has to be an issue. And to all day, but it's because of me. Why shouldn't it start with me? So that's a discipline part of this guy. He says, if an institution or an organization is to be successful, then they must be discipline. And by discipline, is where both management and employees The third principle of management, according to Mr. Henry Five, he says managers must have the right to give orders and the power to exert obedience. So according to Mr. Henri, he says managers must have the right and ability. Okay? Not only right, but also the ability. Okay? To give orders. And the power to exert obedience. But, there's a but, must also keep in mind that with authority comes what? responsibility okay so this guy gives power to the authorities but he said that you could have authority but it has to be accompanied with responsibility what that means is as a manager you should be able to Give orders. You remember one function of management? Okay? Where you can give orders. What is that? Direct. Right? You can give orders. Can you do a discipline? Right? Or don't do a discipline. That's an order. Okay? And the power to exert communities. If you can only give orders but you don't have the power to exert obedience, then you don't have the power. Right? However, there is a but. And the but is that you should always keep in mind that with every authority you have comes a responsibility. Where you need now to balance up. Okay? where you are not supposed to abuse your authority. You are not supposed to abuse your power. Right? That's a straightforward. Unit of command as another principle of management, according to Mr. Henry Fyre, unit of command. What does that mean? What it means is that each employee, okay, each employee should have only one direct force of supervisor. Each employee should have only one boss of supervisor. We not the team. Hmm? Not the team, but each of them. Each of them have one of each of them. Yes. But it's possible that like, you and me and employee could have him as our supervisor. Not that each employee should have a separate. No. No. 
What it means is we could be under him as employees, all right? But what it means is we should not have conflicting lines of command. Conflicting line of command means I'm supposed to report to my car, okay? But then comes another person and says, you guys, you're supposed to report to me. Mm -hmm. Then you create conflict and confusion, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But where do I report to? All right? So this should supposed to be that clear chain of command. Right? Where I should be able to say, she is my supervisor. And let nobody come to me and say, it's like if we say, okay, if we just come here and say, hey, my class, I have a class. Can we have a class now? Then there's another teacher who said, hey, guys, I also have a class. Can we have a class in room eight? You see that kind of confusion. So there should be an order. On Thursday from 8 to 10, you report to me. That's my class. Nobody else should come and say, no, I also have the class. And they can't do my class. That's the kind of confusion which uh, Mr. Fire says shouldn't be there. There should be a clear clear uh, supervisorship where I say, so and so is my supervisor. That's the person I think reporting to and nobody else. And that clear, not necessarily to nobody else because there should be laid out rules where we say, okay, in the absence of my supervisor, where do I go? So, chances are, you could have an establishment, okay? Okay? Where these are employees under him, and these are employees under him, these are employees under him. The three are at par, all right? Same position, but perhaps different sections, right? So, there are times when you say, okay, if this is my direct supervisor, in his absence, where do I go to? Sometimes maybe let me do it like this. Uh, I report to him, he will report to him, or sometimes you could have uh, something like this. And something like this. Okay? So, if I can't report to him, if he's not here, can I go to his counterpart, different section, but same thing? Or can I go to somebody who is senior than him? It depends. This can be added. There are some institutions where bosses are bosses because of their credits and not their expertise. In that situation, you can as well go to this one because this one is at the same grade as this one. So this one automatically becomes your boss. Like in the police, for example. It's all about seniority. Right? But then, some would argue that, but these guys are in a different section. Though, they are your boss. So you say, okay, in the absence of this one, then I'll go to somebody who is more senior, but in the same section. So what Mr. Fire says is that there should be that clear demarcation and say, this is the chain of command. I have to report to Mr. X. In the absence of Mr. X, I should go to him. So that you don't create a situation where anybody would just simply come in and say, look, you were supposed to report to me. Because then you will create lots of um, um, uh, inconveniences and, and 
Let's hope it's <laughs> chatting with us. Okay. Do you guys have another class or no? You? Oh, but just need to show just the best thing. Oh, yeah, like losing hand is here, but then you see it. So, yeah, you yeah. do it. Yeah, but me and me too. Okay. Alright, no, that's, that's a matter. Okay, I will share this notes. Do you have a phone number for WhatsApp? Yeah. Uh, will you please share that because um, I have prepared uh, a number of notes and things. Did you get the assignment? Um, I don't think she sent me, but I didn't get it. You didn't get it. Ask for it because the yeah, date, you get it. You get it. You don't abide by that if you can't send it by a problem. So, if I have your number, then I will send it direct to you. But, um, okay, get my number. Yeah. 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 Awesome. All right, so maybe let's call it in. 